what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I'm here with Marty McDonald, Bad Rhino, and I'm going to formally introduce Marty in a second. Before I do, I always like to mention past episodes of the podcast. Since this is um, kind of in the top agency realm, um, I would like to point people to check out the interview I did with Todd Tasky. He gives valuable advice when selling your agency, some mistakes agency owners uh, make, and you can check out the Second Bite podcast, which he runs. Chris, uh, Chris Clark from the Digital Ignite talked about how they filled a minor league stadium. That was a fun story. And Sam and David Littlefield um, had an agency for over 41 years, and they talked about the transfer of power from father to son, but that can translate to translated power to the new owner, whatever it is. So that was a great one as well. So, and this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. At Rise 25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships. We do that by helping them run their podcasts. You know, Marty, I know you've been podcasting for a while. For me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships, profile them, their thought leadership, and have on the people and companies I admire. So if you've thought about podcasting, if you're a business, you should, hands down. I've been saying that for over a decade. Um, and if you have questions, you can go to rise25.com, email us, happy to answer any questions that you had. I mean, Marty, over the past, I've had best, you know, uh, foreign best friends, gone to weddings, gone to family vacations with the people that I have on my podcast. So I just love it. I know you do too. So uh, without further ado, Marty McDonald's the co-founder and CEO of Bad Rhino. Uh, they're a full service social media marketing agency based in Pennsylvania since 2002. I wonder what the internet was like then for an agency, Marty. Uh, they service and specialize in e-commerce and two main areas are craft beer and golf companies. He also wrote the book, Great Beer Is Not Enough and hosts a podcast, Taps and Teas. You can check out badrhinoinc.com. Personally, he loves golf. If you're watching the video, you can see US Open pictures. You can see a full set of golf clubs. I mean, you know you're hardcore if you have them. Just at a moment's notice, you can go. And they've worked with the PJ of America, some local uh, areas, laser putt, indoor golf simulator companies. They run golfing fanatics and golf cheap steak, uh, cheap steaks, cheap, wait, cheap skates. Uh, and you can check out those Facebook pages as well. So, Marty, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Jeremy. And, uh, Awesome intro. And yeah, everyone stumbles around the golf cheapskate uh, brand. That's for sure. <laughs> you hear a lot of different things. And then the other thing is, is yes, I've been doing digital marketing since 2002. Bad Rhino was formed in 2010, just to mm -hmm. edit that. But that's uh, but it's all good. Yeah. And the internet, I feel like a, an old man sometimes when I talk about the internet back in 2002, 2003, when I was first getting started. <laughs> You know, when you started, I know you have a, a co-founder of Bad Rhino. How did you guys meet? So Rich and I met actually around 2003, four-ish <clears throat> at a separate company. And um, he was still in a graduate school at the time. And we really didn't work that much together. It was just like, oh, he's a good guy, you know, type of thing. And a few years later, you know, I went my separate way. He went his own way. And a few years we connected and he was starting a blog. And the blog was called cornonthejob.com. And uh, he started it right when uh, the market tanked and everybody was looking for a job. And what he did was just give away really good advice for people looking to uh, find a job. And it was tough right then, um, 2008, 2009. And he just got all this really good PR and press and everything around creating that brand because he was just helping people try and find jobs. Really didn't think much about it. And then all of a sudden he started going on, you know, Sirius XM, like Martha Stewart show and a bunch of other things that he was getting recognized for. And um, suddenly he had like a little business and we started meeting off and on about that. He would take me out to lunch and just asking my advice. And then um, about a year and a half after that, I was working at a separate company and he came in my office because I hired him and uh, he's like, I don't want to do this anymore, but I got an idea because people keep asking me about social media and how to do it for their business. And that day, Bad Rhino was born. So why Bad Rhino? So that same day, 
Rich walks into my office. He had been working with me for about four or five months on a contract basis. And he didn't really want to do it. He, you know, it was like one of those times where he was like, I'm not sure what I want to do. If you use some extra money. And I'm like, I need to hire somebody I can trust. And Rich definitely falls into that category. Um, he came in and, and he started, you know, asking all these questions. He's like, I know you do some things on the side and, and this, that. And I was like, okay, where are you going with this? And I know Rich to be super well thought out. And he's very organized on certain things. And I'm like, all right, Rich, if you come up with a cool name, I'm in and I'll help you out. Right. And at that time, I wasn't really thinking past that. I was trying to almost get him out of my office and knowing Rich, I was super busy. I'm thinking this guy's going to take like two weeks or more to come up with a name because he's just methodical on certain things and he's going to research things. Well, 45 minutes later, he came in. I can't remember the other 10 names, but he wrote down 12 names. One of them obviously was Bad Rhino and the other one was Moosehorn. And uh, we got started and met for the next few weeks. And at that point, I was just kind of like, all right, here, here's how you would get started. And next thing you know, we became partners and been doing it ever since 11 years later. Talk about, you know, Marty, I know it's great to have a partner um, because you know, sometimes it can be lonely. Um, and also you just share that, you know, you, you have a personal interest and you just share that hard work and, and ownership over the company. On the other hand, there's joint decisions and there's other things. I mean, it's like a marriage. So I'm wondering how you handle, you know, if you, there's disagreements and I can, you know, see, um, especially if someone is a high fact finder takes longer, there may be, well, if you're a quick start, okay. If anyone's taking their Colby before, but you know, okay, let's just run and do it. I can see, be like, okay, one person gets frustrated with the other person because you're holding up the process, but the other person you balance each other out a little bit. So I'd love to have you talk about you smile, you're smiling. So go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, it describes the whole, almost the yin, the yin and yang of it. Right. Um, I'm laughing because like, as you're saying these things, I'm like, I can think of like very specific spots and it, it's just like the name, like bad rhino. Like we went through like a, a mini um, branding exercise and we paid a bunch of money and somebody was like, well, you should talk about how you went on safari and you came and saw a rhino and all this other jazz. And I was like, I really like the truth, you know, and putting that out there with that. And, I tell Rich all the time, I'm like, there are zero people on this earth I think I would ever partner with in a business. And the reason is, is I'm lucky enough to have somebody like Rich because he does balance me out. Like he'll call me out on something when we're talking and he doesn't even like a lot of times when he watches this, he'll get a kick out of it. He doesn't even realize he's doing it, but I'm like, oh shit. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's something we should think of where I'm like thinking very much bigger picture all the time. And he will admit like he struggles a little bit with thinking further down the road. So it balances us out and the disagreements and stuff like that. I think the best part with having a partner um, in my case anyway, is that I can just say, Hey, what are we doing? <laughs> like, like, let's just stop and talk about it. And he'll let me know like what he's feeling and where he's at. And I think that's been like eye-opening for me. Um, in, in the fact that the way he tells me that in a business setting really helps the trajectory of it. I mean, it's 11 years, right? So like you have to be doing something right to be in business for 11 years, right? Number one. Number two, not to try and like kill each other at some certain points, you have to do something right too, right? So in putting all that together is it's just a balance. Like you hit the nail on the head with like your description there, like right into this, you know, where's he fall in this? Like he's meticulous in certain things, like stuff that I don't even think of. On the other side of it, he sometimes doesn't think of like, well, what if we do this, then what happens? And that's where I have to jump in is like, okay, if we do this, this is the road it's probably going to take us. If we do that, then this is the road it's going to take where it's going to take us. And it great creates a great partnership. And like I said, um, he's not on this podcast right now, but if he was sitting right next to me, there's really nobody that I would partner in business with other than him. Marty, what was one of those times uh, where there was like a crossroads of a decision or that it could have been something that there is, you know, not necessarily a disagreement, but there you kind of have to, you know, duke it out in a healthy way 
for the path of the company um, on yeah. the decision? I think more or less it was around 2014 um, where the internet became social media, social media became the internet, right? And we had done really well and you get comfortable in doing things when you do them really well. And you're like, ah, you know, this is, this is cool, but you have to look a little bit further than that. And our clients and our new clients, potential clients were asking us for different services that we just didn't provide. And, uh, you know, my famous line, I probably overuse it. It's probably done, at least in our closed door meetings within Bad Rhinos. I'll say, well, if you don't want to be in business anymore, that's fine because we can just keep going down this path. Right. Um, and that was the point where I wouldn't say it was heated, but it was like, well, which direction do we have to go to? And that was just finding the right partners to have video, having the right partners to provide SEO, having the right partners to provide websites and things like that. And it just gets like that little contentions because when you push outside of each other's comfort zones, like I was fine doing, Hey, you want to do a website? Great. You want to do email marketing? Great. You want to do this? You want to do that? I'm really good at that because I've had a little bit more experience in there where Rich didn't. So you have to push past some of those things to understand like, Hey, this is where we go, but you don't have to do the work or nor lead the team in order to do that. We can find people that can do that and help bolster our services so that we're not just the social media team that's out there. Other than that, I think it just comes down to little things that you have to make decisions on, but I wouldn't say it ever got really contentious where you're arguing. It's just making your point and understanding where you want to go. And we have a nickname for our company and his name is Brad and it's Brad Rhino, right? It's a little, you know, Rhino. And uh, it's always, you have to look at what's the best interest for Brad. And that's kind of what we do. It's made it a person. <laughs> <laughs> Marty, what um at what point you bring up a good point, like from an agency, because you know, when you serve clients and they trust you, they're like, what else can you do? Here are other needs. At what point do you say, you know, we don't do that, we specialize in this, and mm -hmm. or and be like, listen, we have this other partner working with a partner versus at some point going, well, you know, it's that kind of push pull between specializing and adding another service on. It's really market dictated. Um, and it, what I'm saying is we never really go outside of anything that we <clears throat> didn't feel comfortable in doing, right? That's a key point is like, I wouldn't say, oh yeah, we're gonna run like a direct mail campaign and write all the copy for it and then have billboards and then TV and then radio. Like we wouldn't go that far. But these were like services that a digital agency, in my opinion, should be able to at least provide or guide their clients. And we had current clients coming back. It wasn't new clients. It was current clients. They were like, hey, you guys are doing a great job with this. We're doing a new website. We want you guys to lead it. And it was like, well, we don't do websites. And they were like, well, you better figure it out because we want one agency. Right. It was like. Um, um, like an ultimatum like, almost. No, I wouldn't say it. we were like a victim of our own success in a way that way where we had some really good clients and they were like, Hey, can you guys handle this? Our other agency blew it. You know, Hey, can you handle this? So it was like coming from a, a market situation. Then I also realized just in our sales that people were asking for more and more of that. Like, all right, this is great. You guys handle social, but we also need this and we need that. And it was never really going outside of where we would feel comfortable, but it was just being smart about it. Um, you never want to do that as an agency or any business owner where, Hey, I'm the plumber. Hey, can you rewire my house for electricity? And, okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, you don't want to do that. Um, but yeah, it's just sometimes the market changes and you have to go with it a little bit in digital. And I learned that very early on, um, just being a solopreneur back in, you know, 2002. Talk about, um, building a team, um, and key hires. So now it's, uh, you know, you and Rich. And what were some, what was a key hire throughout the process? I think every hire is a key hire when, you know, we're, we're not trying to grow to like a hundred people. Right. And my prior career was in staffing and I got lucky enough to work with a lot of startup companies. And I also saw a lot of startup companies like balloon in size, and then they had to lay everybody off. And when we started this, you know, quote unquote for real, um, after we got our first clients and then Rich was like, oh my gosh, we actually have a business here in the first four months. And I said, okay, here's the one caveat. And the only thing I'm ever going to say that, you know, for me to be involved is I want to be a flexible 
workforce. I don't want to be, you know, tied down with hundreds of employees, so to speak. And that's not to denigrate like employees or businesses that are growing like that. I just always saw the flexibility in there that you can have a nice business, a really good business, and only have like maybe up to 10 key players. The key hires are super important. So almost every hire at that size of a business is a key hire, right? It doesn't matter whether it's an intern, doesn't matter whether it's your person that's going to come in and be your CMO, which we did, person that's going to come in and run all your paid ads, which happens to be the same person. Then now you're getting into account management and then people that are doing day-to-day work, all those types of things. And the, the key hire is what you have to go through is where do you want to go? Can you articulate that vision to that person? And then where do they fit in so that they can be successful with their responsibilities and the job that they're tasked to do it, you know, tasked to do. At what point did you decide we want to bring on a CMO? Well, I was kind of, um, I knew I was searching for one probably as early as about three years in and I was acting CMO along with Rich. You know, we kind of tag team a lot of stuff in the first four years. And from 2014 to about 2016, it was always in the back of my mind. If I find the right person, let's bring them on. Because the strategy is what they're ultimately paying you for. And that's what we get paid for, right? Um, I'm not saying anybody can just do Google ads or YouTube ads or Facebook ads. I'm not saying anybody can just do it, but some of that's just blocking and tackling. But the actual strategy part, where you have to be able to look through that lens and say, this is what you're going to get, Mr. or Mrs. Client, and this is the ROI you should start to expect. It's you know time consuming. And I started looking for that when we really started to grow a little bit more and we started to bring on bigger clients that demanded more. And it was almost dumb luck. A good friend of mine reached out. I posted an ad because I was like, all right, I need to get some more traction on this. And he just reached out and said, Hey man, why don't we talk about that? I might be open to it. And, you know, we brought on Eric, um, four and a half years ago, I guess, almost now in a full-time capacity, three years and change ago, but it was like a process because bringing somebody in on a strategy side on a smaller agency, um, which we were then looking at it and going, okay, they share the same philosophies, but more importantly, they have to be able to articulate what the actual strategy is from beginning to end. And that's not an easy thing to find. Um, but, you know, taking that loosens the burden on, you know, the people that we have doing it, but also gives them a clear direction. And really that inflection point is when the work gets, you know, too much for whoever's doing it, you know, it's no different than any other business. You want to keep growing. All right. It seems like you've done a good job as far as like longevity with partner and staff. And maybe this comes from your staffing days, but I love to hear what were some of the things you witnessed um, in the staffing of as far as mistakes with, with hiring? Uh, so there's a lot of, like, this is a long story. Wow. <laughs> this is a long, a lot of stuff. One of the things that I saw is like smaller companies, <clears throat> I'm talking like, you know, you have like a core of like three or four people where they wanted to kind of get more diverse ideas faster. So they hired different types of people from different types of backgrounds and everything. And it diluted that mini power that kind of started them off. Right. I think the biggest thing I learned watching that first from a startup standpoint is that you kind of need a core team at first and, and get that core team and maybe build on a couple of people that are very similar to you in thoughts and theories and everything like that. Then go and start to bring in a difference of opinion. If you do that too early, what happens is you dilute that momentum because everyone feels like, oh, well, here's a dissenting opinion. Well, you want that at some certain points. You want people that are different backgrounds and different uh, experiences as well as different uh, expertise. But if you do it too early, what I saw was like a lot of those things that were going up and having a great trajectory, they just kind of fizzled because there was a little bit of infighting. Um, the other thing that I saw was getting too big too fast. Like there's certain points where hey, we need this person because I don't want to work the extra 10 hours this week, you know, as an owner or as a partner or as the CMO or whatever, we need to bring somebody on. And there's totally credible, like, don't get me wrong, like, that's a good thing to bring up. 
Um, but at the same time, hiring just for the sake of hiring, because there's a short little project early on in an early stage company, I've seen that kind of blow up. And I think you have to get calculated and coordinated with that hiring as you're starting out to make sure you bring in the expertise to get over there. So look at different things, not just hiring an employee, but look at a contractor, look at uh, where you can potentially outsource some things before you start really building that team and focusing on that culture and spending a lot of time spinning your wheels just to bring people in to just grow, grow, grow. I hope that makes sense. A lot yeah, so it sounds like, you know, look at the different options is a big thing. It's like, if you're thinking of hiring well, why not look at a contractor? Why not look at another company? Why not look at, I mean, there's other uh, possible solutions. Sure. Than yeah. just bringing someone on. Yeah, and that's why you see is like, oh, we need a, you know, a web designer because we have all these web projects and they wind up bringing on, you know, a brand new person to do that full time. And maybe they bring on the right person, but then they really didn't focus in on why they had so many web projects during that time. And then that work dries up, then you have to lay somebody off and having to lay people off is, in my opinion, I had to do that early on in my career 20 years ago. And then a couple other times, it's the worst thing um, really to go through. And it kind of just stunts your growth in spots. I mean, there's always sometimes reasons you have to make changes, but when you just have to realize or make changes because, Hey, this person's doing great, but we don't have the business or we're going in a different direction because we didn't plan for this. That's never any fun. <laughs> Marty, you know, um, before we hit record, we were talking about um, what's really working. Uh, for your clients and yourself, which is video. So I'd love yeah. for you to talk a little bit about what you're doing with the video. Yeah. So video and our friend, I, our mutual friend, Ian Garlic, um, you know, he, he helped open my eyes, but it was our CMO, Eric, that he was hounding me because he's responsible for our, our lead flow in a, in a certain way. And he was like, dude, we got to do videos. We got to do videos. And I was like, all right, we'll map this out for me. And we we were doing fine with Google ads and paid Facebook ads and referrals and, and other things. And I was like, you got to tell me why video. And he, he went in and told me, and I was like, okay, let's, I'll, I'll invest in this, but I need like a clear path. And <clears throat> we started out on YouTube and I, you know, reached out to I and said, okay, we're going to do this type of video and need to have this together. And he was like, no problem. And we went and we did that and came back and started running the ads. And the first is, you know, the first layer of it is brand awareness. So anybody with a YouTube channel, you should start focusing in on just the brand awareness, get your views up, get everything going get eyeballs on there, create some small ads and some small and longer videos as well, but just get that up. The second part of that, what I saw, which I was like, all right, let's see if this works was you know targeting our ideal customers so i went did the video spoke to the camera like i would be speaking and answering questions to any one of our clients and started going down piece by piece and saying all right this is what they normally ask let me answer it this is what they normally ask let me answer it and built like a mini sales funnel there's no um landing page or anything it just goes back to our website but we drive it all through youtube and putting those out there, you know, within 90 days, our lead flow increased. But then even more importantly, the quality of the person talking to us was a lot better. And then the second or, you know, part 2A to the quality of the person was they would reference the YouTube videos. <laughs> they were like, I feel like I know you. Or if they were talking to somebody else on the team, they would be like, yeah, I saw this guy, you know, Marty was talking about it. He was answering all our questions, kind of like what we're thinking right now. We don't know if we're a good fit, but we thought we should reach out. And then it was like so on and so forth. And then we watched our views start to skyrocket. And then the one big win we, we got was down in Atlanta, you know, Delta Airlines. And it's a division of Delta. It's not Delta Airlines, but they came through, they put us through, they wanted to put us through an RFP process. I'm like, I don't really participate in those. They came back and they said, well, we'll bypass that, but you have to have a call with the board of directors. And then we got in there and it was a literally a five minute call. I was a little irritated at first because they're like, yeah, we're done. And I was like, we didn't even get started. And they're like, oh, we watched all your YouTube videos this morning and, and we really liked it. And it just followed the same pattern of what you told us in the original call and what you submitted form wise. And it was great. And they hired us and, you know, it, it worked out really well and it was just tracking through there. So now 
we've done it. We were doing it for our clients. You know, we were kind of like the cobbler's children. We were crushing it on YouTube, but we never really looked at it for ourselves. And um, now it's, you know, working really well. It's kind of the best thing that we have going um, lead flow wise, but the way people are today, they like to consume content and videos the best way and podcasting too. Talk, what's a common question you get? Sure. Like how is, you know, how's my current agency failing me? You know, um, what am I missing in the reporting that they're doing? What am I not looking for? Can they do better? You know, I'm not out by any means. I don't like it when clients leave us for another agency because I'm like, okay, well, if you feel more comfortable, it's a relationship thing, then that's fine. But, you know, a lot of those common questions that come back are like those. But then the other meatier questions are, what's your philosophy? How do you put everything together? How does Bad Rhino work? Um, what, what do you do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? How do we get our reports? How do you tell us we're doing well? And I just started rambling and answering all the questions and just putting them back out there and, and going for it. And the videos, you know, the views have skyrocketed, but then you also hear on every call, like I said earlier, whether it's me or somebody else on the team, they're like, yeah, we went through all your YouTube videos. And you're like, really? I'm like, I don't know if somebody wants to listen to me for that long, but it's been working out really well. <laughs> I guess if they have a deep question, they'll listen, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think. Will they consume on your YouTube channel or will they consume on your website? Well, we're redoing our website now to kind of fit that model a little bit more, but they actually watch them on YouTube. And what I've learned by asking the prospects, clients, candidates, leads, whatever you want to call them um, over the past two and a half years is what one was the one they're like, I actually watched most of them, you know, and I would say, okay, would anything stand out? And they were like, really? What stand out was like just seemed like the information that whether it was rich talking or myself talking was that you were just talking directly to us and those are the things that people i think miss in their agency and we may not be the best fit for everybody but what we always try to do is create the relationship with the client that they can ask us those questions so that we'll spend the time especially on the front end we'll spend the time to make sure that they understand what's going on and where they're at. And that's how we just built the YouTube channel to do exactly that. I know, Marty, for you, you really are a big proponent of omni-channel, the mm -hmm. omni-channel approach. So talk about that. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about YouTube right now, right? And if you only <clears throat> leverage one channel now in 2021, almost 2022, if you can believe that, um, <laughs> You know, when you just focus in on one channel, you tend to dilute a little bit of your message, but not everybody is just sitting there on a YouTube or a Facebook or an Instagram all day long. So you want to put your message into multiple channels so you can hit them on YouTube and then they see you again on Facebook then they see you again on Instagram. Then they're reading something in the New York Times and there's your little ad and you're almost everywhere at all times. That's really the approach for digital marketing that I've seen, especially during the pandemic. Um, it was headed that way, but it just astronomically shot up in the past 18 months of that's what's working. And that is something that we've always talked about, like get them into your ecosystem, get them to consume some of your content, then hopefully get one ask, maybe get them on an email list. Then you get them onto a Facebook page or group or Instagram, build that community. Because every sale, it doesn't matter whether it's a t-shirt, coaching, agency services, whatever, they're going to be looking at you about five, seven, 10 times before they make a decision to pick up the call or click buy. So if you're only using one channel, you're missing those opportunities and they're not going to sit there and watch every single YouTube video until they say, oh yeah, we should call these people. Right. Tell me more about how you grew golf fanatics. <laughs> Um, so that has been like a labor of love in many different ways. It's had many fits and starts over the years, but the one reason that we build it and we still build it today, I mean, we have like 40,000 really hardcore golfers on our Facebook page and like another 17,000 on Instagram. And then we have an email list of about 65,000. And the reason I just tell you the numbers 
is that it's just community building in its um, longest form, I would say. What we did there was to prove out that we can grow golf communities for potential golf clients, number one. Number two is to monetize those. They're both undergoing some web maintenance and some other things to be relaunched here in 2021. But then we can leverage the, the information. So if we get a golf client, we can post content on golf cheapskate or golfing fanatics and say, okay, this is what gets response. So we can show you that, Hey, in your community, you might want to run an ad that looks like this, or it looks like that testing bed, testing bed, among other things. This way we can show how it will work. Um, there's a lot of other things that go into it, but you know, that's how we built it. So we had credibility in golf and beer and a couple other niches that we're in and just keep working on, on those to build the communities that we can leverage for our clients as well as for ourselves. Do you find Marty that some people want to work with you in that realm because it's a value add? I think in part is a hundred percent the value add. Um, it's like, Oh, by the way, I could send your, you could work with us. By the way, we could send an email to our 65,000 email subscribers. Uh, that sounds pretty compelling. Yeah, it does. And then you can also tell them, be like, yeah, and there's about a 10% buy rate on the 65,000. So about 6,000 are highly, highly engaged. I'm not saying you would 10% conversion, but they'll click for sure. And then you can start to put them into that whole omni-channel approach and that ecosystem that we were talking about. But yeah, it's 100% the value add but also prove some things out. It's like a giant testing ground. We've done it for a couple other niches that we're in, like I said, but it is the value add there for sure. Who is ideal for you in that realm? Oh, e as a client. Yeah, e-commerce clients across the board. Uh, we work with quite a few um, in a variety of niches, not just in golf and craft beer, but we also work with like, you know, sportswear and, and a bunch of others that will rattle off and masks and safety and a lot of clothing and things like that. But really ideal is somebody that's looking to grow. You know, maybe they, they're, they've crossed the million, million and a half mark and they need to kind of go to that next spot, which is like 5 million and they want to grow. And they probably have one person handling all their marketing, but our agency have bolt on and help them scale their ads and help them grow from there. Um, that's really ideal. What's hot in the golf niche now? Everything right now, Ryder Cup just happened this weekend. So it's all about the USA and all that fun stuff. But really hot in the golf niche is almost everything. Pandemic brought out like, hey, here's a sport that you can you know go to and do and be outside and you know get some exercise and do things like that. So golf on, on that level, interest and intrigue has been going up. And then there's still the 27 million or so golf nuts that are in the U.S. that will buy and do anything just because they're like me and they're, they're going to be in golf. But in terms of, you know, hot, you'll see a lot of trends in clothing. You also see instruction and, you know, ways to get out there and get new people into the game, which I think is most important. I mentioned the simulators. That mm -hmm. seems like uh, okay. I think during COVID, I got an Oculus Quest 2 because I couldn't do my normal workouts. What's um, new in the kind of the VR space? Yeah. So like you'll see things like Top Golf, um, Drive Shack, I think is another one. So they're outdoor kind of fun, video game esque. You know, put a golf club in the hand, so it's different than a driving range, and you can play games. So you have that. But then there's a lot of simulators popping up. You know, that are similar to that, but they're a little bit more for like a real golfer, where you can just upload a course. And you can play there and you can get, you know, 18 holes in and probably a little over an hour, which is, you know, super fast. Plus you can practice, you see things like golf tech, which has got a lot of technology behind it to help you improve your swing and do better on the golf course. So those things are really hot, but the indoor simulators, you see people putting them in their homes. Um, that's a pretty costly endeavor, but Hey, if you have it, I would do it. Um, and then you would go from, from there where you have people bring people together on a golf course, so to speak, virtually, where they can hang out for an hour, hour and a half and have a good time. And it's not a whole four hour, three hour investment um, all the time. You know, first of all, Marty, I really appreciate your time. I know we have the mutual friend, Ian Garlick, and he talks about you and uh, he's like, you need to have Marty on the podcast and talk about how he runs his agency, talking about video and all the, the stuff you're doing. So I appreciate your, you know, your thoughts and stories. The last question I have is, I love to hear about 
uh, mentors. You know, we all have mentors uh, and lessons you learned in whether it was a business mentor or specifically business and in, in agency mentor and in something you learned from them. Yeah. Uh, in terms of marketing and, and agency wise, um, not so much more in agency wise, but marketing in general has really been Dan Kennedy. Um, you know, never met the man, but probably the biggest mentor in terms of content and books and direct sales and, and things like that, eliciting that response and that psychology, because in the last couple thousand years, the psychology hasn't changed. It's just the medium that you deliver that in. Right. So that's really been, I didn't realize you were such a, uh, Student of direct response. Oh yeah, big time. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think direct response. Are there other people in direct response that you also follow or have looked yeah, at? Yeah, I mean, I can, you know, there's a ton, but mainly the one that I kind of form everything off of has been Dan. Like, just kind of comes back to it. It's just simply the way he describes things, and I think it gets down to a certain way that you have to talk to people to elicit that response. Agency world, you know, I mean. You know, one of my coaches, Jim Palmer, has been great. Um, he's been awesome over the last years of just directing me into like that. But he's also a student of Dan um, there. And then, you know, Jason Swank and a handful of others that I've interacted with over the years. You know, I always seek out somebody every couple of years. And um, I always like to interact with just people that are doing it more so than having like a mentor. Um, you can learn a ton by people that are actually in the game. I love, I, I geek out on direct response too, Marty. That's why I, I lit up, you know, I think I did over some six or eight month period. I just went deep and interviewed, I've interviewed probably over a hundred people in the direct response who consider themselves some of the top copywriters or direct, direct response marketers on the planet. I have not had Dan, Dan Kennedy on my podcast, but uh, I have seen him speak a couple of times live and he's he is amazing. And he's, uh, he's like almost like a comedian too. I mean, he's just, um, you know, just the, the information's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And then uh, that's why I don't mention too many others. I mean, there's a bunch I could rattle off, but they're all students of Dan. And uh, I just kind of like to tip my hat to Dan and, you know, th that whole thing for over the years for Glazer Kennedy and whatever it's called now. But um, that's really where I learned a ton way back when and still do. Yeah. People could, should check out my interview I did with um, Adam Witte. Who oh, yeah. ended up buying, yeah. um, buying in, in now it's, I believe it's called magnetic marketing, but it's really Thanks. Dan's IP. And he talks about um, kind of his, you know, how he learned from Dan and how he was a student that, you know, of Dan's and GKIC at the time. And then just wanted to bring magnetic marketing more to the forefront for people. Yeah. So. I and mean, that's how we built a lot of the stuff around bad rhino um especially in like creating facebook posts you know i didn't do a ton that was like rich but i would add in some direct response in there and you watch it work and then people would be like why does that work and i'm like it's worked for years and years and years <laughs> amen well marty first of all thank you let's point people towards um you know you can check out golfing fanatics on facebook you can check uh, check out bad rhino inc.com are there any other places that we should point them online obviously i mean check out just search bad rhino on uh, youtube and, and watch some of the videos and everything else is right there on our website or on the youtube channel and you can find out everything about us right then and there cool thanks marty thanks everyone what i got you can't buy it resides between my eyes walked through the fire came out better on the other side see lights like a beach if you find the sand right now i'm feeling like a hundred grand